Okay, I was um, saying earlier, welcome and good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our very last panel session on legacy pollution. My name is Elena Vauli. I'm the Pacific Islands Office Lead for US EPA Region 9 based out of San Francisco. And I'm really pleased to be joined by such distinguished panelists today. We have four representatives from the islands and we have uh, two um, federal representatives who will be speaking today. Uh, half of us will be doing so virtually and we have some panelists here in the room with us. Without further ado, I want to turn the floor over to the CEO of the American Samoa Power Authority, Wallen Young, for his presentation. Mr. Young, the floor is yours. Well, uh, and greetings again from uh, American Samoa. Um, 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 we have uh, three projects under legacy pollution. Uh, the first one is uh, MSW gasification plant. Uh, second one is recycling infrastructure. And the third one is derelict vessels. I will just cover the MSW gasification plant project. And uh, American Samoa EPA Director Fama will uh, cover the second uh, two projects. The MSW gasification plant, uh, it's, uh, it's about a, a project costing 10 million. Um, the plant capacity is uh, up to 60 tons of MSW per day. Acceptable waste include uh, kitchen waste, cardboard, uh, rubber, shredded tires, woods, and uh, greens. Uh, the gas case, gasification byproducts is syn gas and ash. Syn gas will be used to uh, run a gas engine and produce a small amount of power, about 0 0.8 megawatts. The benefits of MSW gasification plant for American Samoa. Number one, it will extend the life of our existing landfill. We have about a four year remaining life on our landfill. There will be no leachate leaks into the ground and adjacent properties. We have very low emissions of foul odor from the plant. It will reduce carbon dioxide and methane emissions, approximately 5,000 tons CO2 equivalent per year. Power production is about 0.8 megawatts and will employ 20 full-time employees. The gas gasification plan status, the RFP process is completed. The project has been awarded. Air permit application has been approved by American Samoa EPA and the land lease is fully executed. This project is shovel ready. On recycling infrastructure, Director Farmer will uh, take over. Uh, Talofa again, uh, all the way from uh, American Samoa. Uh, so, in addition to the proposed MSW uh, gasification plants uh, presented by Director Wallen, we would also like to uh, include uh, the modernization of American Samoa's existing waste management infrastructure uh, for recycling for funding consideration. So, I'm going to be talking a little bit and briefly about uh, some of the issues that we're currently faced with, with the accumulation of of solid waste uh, on our lands and in our waters, and also the concern with our landfill uh, reaching its maximum capacity, and also uh, with all the waste that's going in there with very little recycling being taking place. In addition to uh, issues, we've also added in there uh, the abandoned and derelict vessels or ADD. Uh, we have about uh, 10 abandoned uh, and derelict vessels in our beautiful Pango Pango Harbor. And it's such an eyesore 
um, and one of the concerns that we have is that over time it may create a uh, navigational hazard uh, in our harbor and then there's also the potential uh, to pose a significant threat to our natural resources uh, with our with the marine life coastal habitats and also degrade the uh, water quality in our enclosed harbor uh, moving along to challenges uh, uh, we're faced with some very unique challenges here in American Samoa, uh, mainly due to the limitations to our existing uh, solid waste and uh, recycling infrastructure. And that's due to the uh, lack of proper facilities such as transfer stations, uh, recycling equipment and machinery. In addition to that is our geographic uh, and remote location, uh, along with the ocean freight cost. Uh, making it uniquely challenging uh, you know, to ship recycling containers off island and to sustain uh, recycling on island and to grow the recycling industry in the private sector. Um, so for example, we do have for ocean freight cost, it, it, the average cost to ship a 20 foot container to the US Long Beach is about, uh, uh, about 4,800. A 40 foot container to the US uh, Long Beach is about uh, 6,500. Um, a 20 foot container to New Zealand is about 2,800. Um, if you add and factor in the operational cost, the labor cost, the overhead cost, and that creates conditions uh, that are not economical, feasical, uh, feasible uh, for our recyclers on island to break even or even to make a profit. Another challenge that uh, we're faced with is the lack of funding to transform uh, our existing waste uh, management infrastructure to promote uh, and sustain recycling and for the safe removal of ADVs. Under our project goals to um, modernize our solid waste management approach, uh, there's a need to further develop our, our solid waste infrastructure for recycling uh, in order to do that, uh, there's a need to construct six transfer stations uh, for the main island of Tutuila and the outer islands of Manua and Onu. Um, this is to sort and segregate uh, MSW uh, to provide feedstock for our gasification plant. <clears throat> and also, uh, there's a need for uh, uh, funding for waste management and recycling uh, equipment such as uh, scrap metal and tire shredders, balers, and waste segregation. Uh, and in, in addition to that, uh, you know, in order to do all of this, uh, you know, we need funding for the implementation of a, of a recycling program to sustain and promote uh, recycling on island and also to support and grow the recycling industry in the private sector. So and then uh, also one of our project goal is uh, we're also requesting for funding for the safe removal of 10 abandoned and derelict ves vessels. In closing, um, much of American Samoa's infrastructure and the services uh, the people rely on are owned and operated by the government. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to say, uh, extend our Famalo and Faftai to OIA uh, for the opportunity to tell our story uh, and our funding needs uh, so that we can move forward. I would like to also thank our federal uh, counterparts for your continuous support over the years and look forward to engaging uh, with you in discussions to transform American Samoa's solid waste management infrastructure. Soifua Maya Manuia. Thank you very Thank much, you. American very Samoa. Much. I was remiss that I, I didn't introduce the second speaker. That was um, the, um, director the director of the American director Samoa EPA, Samoa Director of Amawa Salele. So thank you both, both. Um, CEO Young and yep. Director uh, Salele. So next up, we have two speakers from CNMI. We have the Director of the Office of Planning and Development, Koda Ogmuro Ludong, and the Lead Planner of OPD, Aaron Darrington. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Elena. Again, half a day, talofa, aloha, tiro. Um, my name is Kore Pagumur Uladong. On behalf of Team CNMI, uh, the Office of Planning and Development, and our Planning and Development Advisory Council members, uh, we're grateful for the invitation uh, by the Department of Interior, OIA, and uh, the rest of the federal family uh, to come here and present out on our priority project uh, to address legacy pollution in the CNMI. Uh, the call to address legacy pollution, next slide please. The call to address legacy pollution uh, really aligns closely with three of our uh, comprehensive sustainable development goals. SDG 11, which aims to make our city safe, resilient, and sustainable. Goal 12, which aims to support sustainable consumption and production patterns. And uh, I want to say almost most importantly, goal three, addressing good health and uh, the plans and objectives that have been laid out in close partnership with our hospital and public health uh, to address uh, specifically uh, NCDs. Smart, safe development and redevelopment are being led in large part by our Planning and Development Advisory Council partners at the Department of Public Lands, as well as our zoning office. Additionally, we're working closely with our partners at the Department of Public Works and the CNMI Bureau of Environmental and Coastal Quality uh, to leverage um, the $56 million in ASADRA funds that were appropriated to EPA to assist the CNMI with our comprehensive solid waste planning needs, uh, to which we are also very fortunate and appreciative. Uh, so with that said, uh, our legacy pollution priority project really uh, seeks to address uh, brownfield remediation as we feel it's the most significant source of legacy pollution in our region. Uh, so in addition to that uh, is uh, remediation of FUDs as well. So our project aims to address latent challenges associated with site assessment, identification, and remediation in tandem with the increasing need for enhanced environmental monitoring to meet federal RICRA requirements. Uh, so we're really looking forward to the assistance, support, and guidance of our federal partners uh, to help help us develop and support uh, our legacy pollution pilot project. So with that said, I want to turn it over to OPD lead planner, Aaron Darrington, uh, to take us through the particulars. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And as the previous slide was showing you, one of the guiding themes of the CNMI's Comprehensive Sustainable Development Plan is the aim to support sustainable systems. This means building and maintaining resiliency for our natural and built environment through coordinated planning and implementation of smart safe growth principles. SSG or smart safe growth aims to support economic, social and environmental co-benefits that achieve sustainable and resilient growth in the CNMI now and for future generations. Identifying and remediating lands and waters that are negatively impacted by legacy pollution is critical to ensuring development and redevelopment of healthy, vibrant communities. Unfortunately, it is also a daunting challenge. As my di director detailed, we are working with numerous partners whose logos you can see visually, visualized on this screen here uh, to support development and redevelopment planning of public lands, manage solid waste, uh, with our partners at the Bureau of Environmental and Coastal Quality, supported by US EPA. And we are also working to meet uh, RICRA monitoring requirements through the program that uh, was supported by the ASADRA funding. These initiatives have identified systemic challenges that need systemic solutions. Specifically, in order to ensure we are using reliable environmental data that demonstrates we are meeting human and environmental health protective standards, we must address the challenge of costly and often questionable data analysis that is associated with these programs. Due to our remote location and limited regional technical capacity, soil and water samples must be set to the mainland for processing. Shipping costs are high and often these samples exceed holding times and temperatures, which means that they're not meeting recommended QA quality control quality assurance requirements. 
this process does not reflect best practices, particularly for some contaminants of concern, such as VOCs, which EPA recommends are tested as soon as possible and may result in low sample detection rates. And we're using this data to guide remediation prioritization to inform the success of our remediation efforts. And so it's a data gap that we hope to improve upon through a programmatic solution. Um, we would like to suggest that in addition to installing monitoring wells to ensure that we achieve RICRA compliance, that we work to address the legacy pollution um, that is left over really from World War II from uh, the, the CNMI and other sister islands in the Pacific, uh, having played a pivotal role in those activities years ago, uh, we hope to be able to have a program to build capacity on island to create a, a cohort of environmental specialists who have good jobs and who are able to provide good data to inform data-driven planning processes for our public land, for our environmental compliance, and beyond. So on the maps on your screen, you can see um, on the right-hand side, on the Bureau of Environmental and Coastal Quality's uh, open data portal, we have 30 sites that have been identified as potential um, formerly used defense sites and brownfields through EPA's 104K brownfields program. Uh, phase one and phase two assessments have been conducted at numerous locations and are ongoing. And prioritization and remediation remains challenging in part because we have a proliferation of sites and again, challenging data to uh, to try to, to process. The images in the middle of your screen actually show a recent UXO collection and detonation activity, which is a common practice where during development practices of common earth moving activities, when unexploded ordnance is identified, it is uh, stockpiled and then exploded when we have experts on island that can help with the detonation. However, again, this is a costly component of development and redevelopment activities. So what we are proposing here is not just a one uh, and done construction project. We are asking our federal partners and our regional planning allies to assist in developing a program to address a shared need of getting better data analysis in the region uh, through the development of laboratories as well as monitoring programs. So on the next slide, you'll see um, that the challenges have uh, have been magnified. So not only do we have the requirements of RICRA, uh, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act and CERCLA for existing sites, uh, but we also have new contaminants of concern. We have detection of PFAS and PFAS in our water systems. Uh, we have ongoing site assessments and existing locations on Saipan and Tinian. And then we have a, a buildup activity in the northern two thirds of Tinian, which is shown on your screen. Uh, for reference, the Army Corps of Engineers just uh, completed a multi-year one acre cleanup at Chigat Beach in that leaseback area at the cost of about a million dollars for an acre and that's within a 70 acre mortar range site. Just south of that we have about a 600 acre site that was formerly used for stockpiling of uh, ordnance during World War II and EPA is supporting a phase one and phase two assessment there um, to initiate assessments for potential redevelopment um, discussions. However, this is a timely and costly process that be, is made more costly by the fact that we do not have a regional facility to do this kind of work. So in conclusion, in addition to installing these monitoring wells to ensure regulatory compliance on Tinian and Rota for existing solid waste facilities, which is an immediate need of a shovel ready project, we would like to see a more systemic solution that would help achieve better environmental data in our region. This new laboratory that could be sited in the Marianas would also provide systems redundancy and help us respond more quickly to disasters when they occur. So we wouldn't have the same kind of lag times, the same kind of delays and costly expenses when we do have uh, to respond to a disaster in the region. And it would enhance overall regulatory compliance for many programs, including CUC's existing Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act requirements, um, and also the testing that the ECQ laboratory does. It would improve available baseline data and would grow good jobs, pr promote capacity building, help us build facilities to do the lab testing we need for environmental laboratory work, as well as some of the health data that needs to be processed in our CHCC and our, in our hospital as well. So there could be many multiplier effects uh, from an initiative such as this that would be a programmatic approach um, that would take a creative solution that we hope our federal partners will be able to look into a bit more. On the next slide, you will see 
that this initiative would align with and support CUC's uh, sustainable water infrastructure management systems to achieve palatable, potable, and safe water supplies for our islands. It would also help us standardize work plan development, sampling pro protocols, and analysis of our groundwater and soil samples. Right now, we are unable to do any soil sampling in the islands. Uh, it would also provide the best available data to help inform our redevelopment planning efforts through the Department of Public Lands, Public Land Use Planning Process, and more, which is integrated into our comprehensive sustainable development planning. And as my director mentioned, supports many of our sustainable development goals, including goal three, health, goal eight, job diversification of good jobs, um, goal 11, sustainable redevelopment of our communities, and goal 12, good, safe, uh, use of our consumption and production patterns, which relates to our solid waste management initiatives to maximize the use of our land, amplify zero waste initiatives, and make sure that the facilities that we do have are meeting RICRA requirements. Um, so in short, this program would help us build an on-island conduit to support regional water and soil sampling needs. It would save time and money and help improve environmental analysis for the CNMI and beyond. It would support a pipeline of prioritized remediation and revitalization projects and cleanup plans. And ultimately, it would provide generational solutions to support our sustainable growth. On the next slide, I know I'm a little bit over, but I just wanted to say thank you again. We do appreciate this opportunity uh, for your consideration, your support, and we will hope that you will help us leverage this historic funder funding uh, stream to provide for the generational uh, solutions that we need. With programmatic investment and remediation of legacy pollution in our region, we will be better equipped to meet our sustainable growth goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Team CNMI Director uh, Kodep and, and Aaron. We'll now move to Guam, and I'm pleased to introduce a fellow cowboy fan and the administrator of Guam EPA, Walter <laughs> Leon Guerrero. Thank you, Elena. Um, so when I was approached to doing this uh, legacy, uh, to present on legacy pollution sites on Guam, um, my dilemma wasn't um, which site, I mean, um, to identify a site, but which site to uh, talk about. Um, uh, Guam, like many other uh, islands in the Pacific, have uh, numerous uh, uh, incidents that have caused legacy uh, pollution to, to occur on our islands. Uh, World War II. Korean War, uh, the Vietnam War, uh, just regular military operations. And uh, for, for most people that know about Guam, Guam is uh, inundated with uh, many, many military sites. And that's even after the BRAC three and four closures, the property was given back to Guam. And it, so even with that, even the closure of the properties, we had um, you know, BRAC cleanups and, and whatnot that occurred. So Guam has been um, impacted greatly by legacy sites. Um, you know, and each agency kind of has a separate definition for legacy pollution. Um, you, you have the FUDs, which is the formerly, uh, formerly used defense sites that base their definition on um, acquisition dates and, uh, and proper documentation of the real estate turnover. You have the Brownfields program, which basically says that uh, any, any contaminated or even perceived contamination that prevents um, uh, reuse and rebuild under a property. I'm sure the, the federal agencies will, will bring these clear, precise definitions to the table when we're done speaking, but there is, there's a multitude, again, to re restate, there's a multitude of uh, sites on Guam that we have to deal with that involve the um, legacy contamination. One of the things that we want to do, um, so, so basically with that short um, history of Guam, it is in my humble esteem that many sites, if not the entire island of Guam, can also can be looked at, at least in the first uh, phase, as a legacy site for Guam. Uh, again, because of all the impacts that we've had. By no means am I saying Guam is accessible. Please do not get that. We are a wonderful Pacific Island, just like everybody else. We have beautiful uh, environment. We have great uh, water and uh, marine waters. Um, but based on the definition, 
uh, we can expand it, you know, all the problems uh, that may occur being an island with uh, legacy sites. And again, one more, you know, going back to um, why Guam has so many potential legacy sites. I mean, we were occupied by three years by the Imperial Forces of Japan during World War II. We had the reinvasion and retaking of Guam. So, you know, that was during the 40s when there was no accurate records taking. So, again, if you were to expand and look at uh, Guam and the potential for legacy sites, it's, again, in my humble opinion, it could be the entire island. And again, it would be more for using the definition to try to address these sites. Now, again, that doesn't even talk about, you know, the rigorous civilian problems that uh, we incur now, uh, which are not so much as the legacy pollution, but, you know, uh, cradle to grave. And so, we, you know, um, Guam has enough environmental problems or issues that we can take of, take care of uh, with additional funding, and we look forward to any assistance that we can. Um, excuse me. Sorry, my notes got messed up there. Um, so I do want to say that a lot of the legacy pollution sites, uh, we do have federal assistance and, and federal counterparts that are working in good partnership with us. I mean, we have, again, as I mentioned, we have the Army Corps with the FUDS program. We have US EPA with the Brownfields program. We have Navy DOD basically with the installation restoration and uh, environmental restoration programs. And so these sites have been ongoing for, um, these sites and site cleanups have been ongoing for sometimes 20 plus years. Uh, if you don't know about environmental um, cleanup and, and assessment, it's not something like you, you build a plan and then you build a building. Um, it, it, it takes a lot more effort to do the assessment and um, then you know, determine in that assessment, you determine your area of concern uh, and, and then you actually start addressing it. And more often than not, when you're doing your, you're actually doing the cleanup, you actually see that you need more money, more funding to do that cleanup. And so for me, looking at environmental cleanup and, and assessment and legacy pollution problems, it's a, little, it's a lot more complicated than just building a building or de demolishing a building and building a building. And so with that, let me start the uh, actual sites that we were supposed to talk about. So next site, oh, okay, perfect. Okay, what is this, the reasons that this site was picked, which is the 5th Marine Supply Depot, is this is a large site that was determined to have multiple um, operations done. But in addition to that, this site is adjacent to the Tizen, which is the former naval air station. It also has the fuel pipeline that was that was feeding from our bulk storage tanks that led up to Anderson as well as to, uh, at the time, the um, power plant up north for, for the Navy, as well as the GPA uh, fuel line. In addition to that, there is the Ganyar power plant, which had um, PCB contamination that was, um, that was needed to be cleaned up as well as the Ganya Springs power, or Ganya Springs site, which was a um, drinking water site that had, um, unfortunately, PCBs, uh, PCB transformers stored right next to the springs. Um, don't ask me why they did that, but it was done. So there is, a, so that's why this site was picked. Next slide, please. Okay. So some of the things besides the normal, uh, and I say normal, but besides the PCB cleanup and uh, other site, other other chemicals of concern that are associated with power plants and fuel and, and whatnot, um, it was identified that there was a chemical team, warfare team that was part of the 5th Marine Supply Depot. Um, in the records, there is actually no records of what the operations they did, which to me, um, not based on, on our, I guess, the requirement of records showing what work they did and, and developing your, your chemicals of concern, uh, I found quite um, uh, troublesome because when a farmer in the fifth, uh, Marine Supply Depot uh, footprint was tilling his area to, to start a uh, plantation, he came across these ca a case, 
or pigs, as they commonly called in the chemical word world, that had phosgene and mustard gas ampules. Uh, I believe there was uh, a few of these pigs that were found. So immediately, uh, the Army Corps and the Navy did an investigation for the immediate area around there. And uh, they, you know, again, they, they, they discovered that there were, there were multiple pigs within that, that, foot, that area of that footprint. Now, without records showing where this chemical warfare team actually did their operations, and this being the only site that they had, uh, what's to say they weren't doing it in multiple locations uh, within the footprint of the 5th Marine Supply Depot? And instead of just say we don't have records, that's where I find this quite troublesome that uh, uh, you could just say, well, we don't have records, so we don't think that it's a problem in this pro in this parcel. And um, I'd like to, see, and I hope to see that changed. The other other uh, chemical that was re uh, a removal action was done was calcium hypochlorite. As many of you know, it's not that dangerous, but it is a chemical that was used to uh, sterilize and, and clean up water so that it became drinkable. Uh, but you know, again, that was also uh, buried and dumped. And so uh, with all the uh, operations that were done at the 5th Supply Marine Depot, which includes um, you know, automotive garages and things of that nature, just like any other base uh, uh, camp, um, a lot of things were dumped uh, or, or buried upon uh, disposal. Uh, another, another, th another point to point out is uh, in three different locations, we found uh, drums that were buried. Uh, on, on the good side, we seen that these drums were uh, poked with holes, and it seems like there was a, a uh, operation where these drums were being used somewhat, somewhat like a leaching field uh, idea so that flooding would be dispersed and, and whatnot. But as everybody knows, buried drums is a very, very, very uh, bad thing when you come across it. So um, again, we were, we've been lucky that three of those buried drum sites that we found were based, uh, or the operations were for uh, to reduce the flooding in the area. But that should not ever deter the fact that if you find buried drums, you go in as high level as possible to make sure that these drums are not containing uh, extreme hazardous material and or waste. Um, next slide, please. So uh, again, as I was talking about, so uh, with, with the chemical warfare team on site and no official documentation, there's not a big need or big push to look for additional um, hazardous waste or hazardous materials that were dumped. And I really think and Guam believes that uh, we need to revisit that. We have to do a better uh, look as far as the documentation. And even though the documentation is, may not be found in archival research, just the mere fact that we're finding the case uh, slash pigs that are there that had uh, test ampules of uh, bostrine and mustard gas, uh, just because we're finding drums that are there on the site, even though these drums are not uh, directly associated with storage uh, and disposal of hazardous materials and or hazardous waste, I really, Guam really feels that this needs to take another look into it. Next slide, please. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I do want to say this. Um, we do have good partnership with pollution and uh, with, with legacy pollution and the federal government that, that has that does the work on it. Um, but like any other any other partnership that has additional funding, can always make it a better relationship. Uh, you know, personalities and whatnot aside, funding is what makes the the cleanup of these sites go through, and legacy pollution is sometimes the hardest uh, type of sites to identify what the ex exist existing problem is and where we need to spend the funds for. Um, I know, like uh, in FUD's, um, FUD's presentation by the Corps, they talk about, well, they have nationwide, they have presentation, or they have uh, sites that would keep the core busy for the next hundred years or so, um, and, and that's all understood. And um, 
but it does not deter from the fact that Guam, as well as our, our neighboring territories, uh, our ne neighboring territories of uh, Sinai, as well as our brothers and sisters in, in America Samoa and the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, for us to ask. I was, this morning, there was a statement that uh, we're not asking for favors. We're asking to be treated just like everybody else in the nation. And the kind gentleman that made that statement, and it, it rang um, volumes in me that it's like, yes. Um, both, one of, the things, one of the funny things between CNMI and America Samoa and Guam is we always argue who's got the highest per capita of military personnel it, that have enlisted. And I'm sure the Virgin Islands would jump into that if they heard that, as well as Puerto Rico. But you know, um, our commitment to the United States is, is strong, and, and we hold our hearts and our, and, our, and our lives, thankfully, that we are free to be able to have these discussions and have this. But again, like was stated very early in this morning is, we just want to be treated like everybody else and have the same opportunity as everybody else. And that's what this workshop does. We appreciate it. Um, a lot of the things that Guam does, we love to share with our neighboring brothers and sisters, both in the Pacific and in the Caribbean. A perfect example is an abandoned derelict vessel pro uh, project. We're so happy that uh, America Samoa is taking that up and uh, we are willing to share our resources because um, we had the good fortune of starting that already and almost completing 11 vessels removed. And so uh, what we do on Guam, we would love to share with everybody else and uh, we, open it, we open up any information and knowledge that we have. And I know Atlanta's standing up, that means I probably passed my 10 minutes and so I'll get off my soapbox and say thank you everybody for the opportunity and uh, much love and uh, please be safe out there. Thank you. Thank you, Administrator Walter, for um, your remarks and for reading the nonverbal cues. I appreciate that. <laughs> and um, finally, we're going to switch to a virtual presentation by um, the Commissioner of the Department of Planning and Natural Resources in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Commissioner Jean-Pierre Oriel. Good afternoon, everyone uh, that's here in the Pacific time zone and good night uh, to all the region two folks that I see online <laughs> uh, from particularly from Puerto Rico. I saw Zeno, uh, Ma uh, Marilisa, everybody. So uh, thanks for staying up this evening with us. Uh, at least I have the benefit of getting a little coffee in me. Um, so. I this is kind of uh, uh, for me presenting this. Uh, I'm certainly not the expert for the Virgin Islands when it comes uh, to the legacy pollution. Um, I'll actually later on talk about uh, my you know preference uh, from a policy perspective where we m we're hoping that things can go, um, but a little bit. You know, when I listen to all of, of our colleagues here present today and, and see some of the legacy pollution issues um, and, you know, seeing some of their um, attachments to some of the military installations and, and the Virgin Islands, while we were a military installation as well, um, you know, we, we actually didn't have the same impacts. Um, if we if if we were Puerto Rico, it'd be a little bit different. Uh, I know that you know, whether it's the unexploded ordinances and other things that they, they certainly had much more impacts uh, from that. But um, wanting to make sure that our voice is heard in terms of a, a longstanding legacy project. So I'm going to present on something called the Tutu Wellfield Superfund site. Um, next slide, please. So um, the Tutu Wellfield Superfund site, the point of origin was a, a textile factory in, from 1969 to 1971. Um, the property then transitioned to a dry cleaning facility. Uh, it was operational actually for about four years and then it was finally sold. Um, it, it, it closed and reopened again and then in 1981 the, the property was eventually sold 
uh, to the government of the Virgin Islands. And, and what we did is we actually uh, placed, oh, I'm sorry, can um, can you guys click on, I think there's the two pictures that, that just sort of go the um, next slide, or it'll be the uh, picture with the dry cleaning facility. And then the next slide, uh, it'll show that this is the Virgin Islands, uh, the pink building where you can see some of the buses. It's our Virgin Islands Department of Education's curriculum center uh, that's there. And, um, and so this is where we were using the facility not only for administrative purposes for the Department of Education, but also um, where different types of programs are run out of that unit. Next slide, please. So when the dry cleaning facility was operational, uh, tetrachloroethylene was the main cleaning agent. And, um, you know, after having some leaks and such, um, the, there, there was some contamination of the ground. And, and so from 1982 to 1995, in partnership with the U US EPA, um, we've been having, a, we've had a number of studies uh, on that uh, contamination, and we found and mapped approximately 108 acres of the groundwater, uh, or of the the Superfund site is defined as about 108 acres, um, and that groundwater actually leads to um, what is known as the turpentine run gut, or um, more commonly known as as a stream, but guts in in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, next slide, please. So since 2000, 2001, we've been actually employing a pump and treat remediation at three groundwater wells. Um, and this was something that, or is something that's going to be a long-term pump and treat. Uh, again, it started in the early 2000s, and we estimated an additional 30 uh, years. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2018, uh, following the, the storms of 2017, uh, we had an additional re review by the EPA um, of the Tutu well field site just to see if we were making any progress on the pump and treat scenarios. Um, a baseline health risk assessment was conducted and 13 uh, chemicals of potentials uh, 13 chemicals of potential concerns were identified. Different exposure scenarios were considered, particularly with drinking water ingestion and dermal contact, uh, as well as incidental contact and inhalation, because this is an area where there is a, a, a lot of work that takes place um, both publicly and privately. And so um, one of the conclusions that are in the EPA um, a summary document, which you can see a picture of here, where that quote that the cancer risks associated, the cancer risks and non-cancer health hazard indicate that there is significant potential risk from direct exposure to future residents and area workers, and that the proposed alternatives will be necessary to mitigate potential risk with, with existing contamination. So there were five alternate alternatives developed um, and alternatives two and two A with basically states for additional pump and treat uh, remediation uh, was deemed to be the most um, the most favorable alternative for this site. Uh, next slide please. So currently um, the Virgin Islands is actually responsible <coughs> for the treatment. Um, that takes place and it costs us about a half a million dollars a year. Um, and so here directly from the uh, the costs that are actually associated for each of the alternative two and alternative two A, um, there's an additional or a capital cost of about $5 million. And then the cost for the repeated operation and maintenance would be about eight hundred thousand dollars a year um, and the time frame for 
um, the actual operation of this is still estimated to be about 30 years. Um, but but one of the things that is confident is that the the operation and maintenance that it will in fact reduce the health risks to the community uh, in the nearby community. Uh, so next slide. Um, I think one of the things that I just wanted to use the opportunity to state is that again, there are very minimal um, what we would consider or fully qualify as brownfields in the territory. And I think we're we're very fortunate to be able to say that um, there is areas of uh, pollution that will probably require uh, cleanup or when I think about legacy pollution and large scale, it's more along the lines of some of what my partners had actually uh, uh, spoken about today. Um, but one area and in preparation for this conference, what we were asking is whether or not um, the abatement of asbestos containing materials is something that could be eligible. Um, and I think the, re the reason why I sort of want to push this point is that um, you know, the Virgin Islands in the 1940s and 50s when we were starting to develop and those, you know, we were still under the the appointment of the U.S. government at that time, and we saw lots of our housing communities, a lot of the businesses that were in towns, a lot of the office spaces, they were actually developed by the federal government at that time. And a lot of asbestos containing materials was used to outfit those. And now we're in a situation where those properties have been turned back over to the VI government and in order to first and foremost you to use them, we have to first and foremost clean them up properly. Uh, asbestos is a material that cannot be sustained in the landfills in the US Virgin Islands and therefore requires being shipped off, uh, which makes um, which makes you know abatement a very costly procedure for the Virgin Islands. So uh, I just wanted to put in a plug that if in fact that there can be some consideration, um, particularly for the islands and this and the specifics or of, of what we're dealing with can be addressed. Um, it would be really, really greatly appreciated. I know that from the Virgin Islands standpoint, um, asbestos abatement is something that is a legacy issue and how we will be able to deal with that will speak volumes in terms of reusing properties um, and fostering economic development um, within the territory. And then I, I'm pretty sure in terms of an alternative project, uh, again, the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority is in charge of the maintenance and management of our landfills. Our landfills, um, you know, we, we, can, we can be very honest as what, what they were in the very early times. They were just dumps where we just put everything in uh, no source separation or anything. And so what we find is there is a lot of um, contaminated leachate, particularly with heavy metals um, in the Bavoni landfill. We've, we've had a number of studies on that. Um, but I, I think that as we move forward with what we're going to do with our municipal solid waste program in partnership with the Virgin Islands Waste Management Authority, um, we'll begin to come up with more and better plans as to how to address the contaminants uh, and then also being able to address our municipal solid waste for the future. So with that, this is my last slide. Next slide, please. And here to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Commissioner Oriol. And um, that concludes our presentations by our territorial panelists. I want to thank you as a Pacific Islander. It's not in my nature to really aggressively enforce the, the speaker time limits. So I, I thank you for your brevity, but also for just your um, organized and, and thoughtful and, and highly articulate presentations. If you will indulge us, we have um, two federal speakers up next one from EPA and one from, or two, I think, from the Department of Energy. But for the EPA presentation, because we haven't tested the limits of the hybrid conference yet, we wanted to see if we could do a semi-interactive 
format um, for the EPA presentation. So with that said, I'd like to ask if you, the panelists here would remain on um, at the tables. And then for our two uh, virtual um, participants, um, Commissioner Oriol and uh, CEO Young and, and Director um, Asalele, if you're still on, um, we may have some questions after. Uh, so I'd like to now introduce um, the director of the Office of Resource Conservation and Recovery from our US EPA headquarters office, Carolyn Huskinson. Good afternoon, Pacific time. Uh, I am happy to be joining you from Silver Spring, Maryland on the East Coast. And uh, before I go any further, can people hear me and see me? Yes. All right, technology is working. Um, I actually feel like it's uh, it's my turn to be working at nearly 1030 at night my time. I've been on meetings in the past where Pacific Islands colleagues have had to call into our meetings at what is for you very strange work hours. So uh, I feel like it's my turn now and I'm I'm thrilled to be able to be joining you remotely from so far away and hopefully have a little bit of conversation. So um, uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm Carolyn Hoskinson. I'm the director of the Office of Resource Conservation and Recovery. And I'm going to quickly talk with you about two um, important things that we are working on in my office that are very closely connected and um, connected to a number of the, the projects that many of you presented on earlier. Uh, so November 15th, 2021, America Recycles Day was a very exciting day for us. Two very important things happened for our office. One, we released our national recycling strategy, um, part one in building a circular economy for all. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. Um, but that was also the same day that President Biden signed the infrastructure law and under that law, we received funding for recycling infrastructure and a number of other items that I'm going to talk with you about today. So um, November 15th, a very exciting day for us. So our national recycling strategy, which we call a, a series of a circular economy for all. I want to talk a little bit about the importance for us of the word circular and for all. Um, and so uh, when I was a, a child, my father was an economics professor and he used to talk to me as a kid about supply and demand and how supply and demand made the world go round. Um, and that has come back to be very meaningful for me when I think about a circular economy. Um, in a circular economy, we have a supply of materials and a demand for those materials. And in our recycling system, we currently have an awful lot of supply that is not really matched to the demand for those materials. Um, so we have a lot of potentially recycle, recyclable materials that are not very easy to recycle. And we have a lot of contaminated recyclable materials that can't be recycled. And we just have a large volume of potentially recycled materials and not enough demand for those materials. So we know that just putting your recyclable materials in your recycle bin alone is not enough. And that's why we have this strategy. <clears throat> We also really want to talk about the impact of materials management on climate. Um, climate change is a very, very high priority for the Biden administration, something we're working very hard on at EPA. And what a lot of people don't realize is that materials management has a very important role to play. The United Nations International Resource Panel estimated that natural extraction, natural resource extraction and processing contributes to about half of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So we are working on some additional strategies after part one to talk about some of the other materials that we can address to help address these climate issues. So we are also working on a strategy on food and organics. We're working on a strategy on plastics, and we will soon begin engaging with people on our strategy on critical minerals and electronics recycling. So um, we are very excited to be moving forward on those strategies. 
Now, I also said that the phrase for all is very important to us as well in the title of our recycling strategy. Sustainability at its foundation requires social equity and environmental justice is an issue that's also very important to us at EPA. So we want to be very mindful as we talk about these recycling issues that we're talking about the um, impacts on communities from uh, recycling and from waste management as well. <clears throat> so with that, I will turn to the slide that you're looking at right now, which is an overview of the four efforts that we received funding for under the infrastructure bill. First um, is our solid waste infrastructure for recycling grants program. Uh, I have a separate slide on that one I'm going to talk about in a minute. We received uh, $275 million, which breaks down to $55 million per year for grants. Um, the second uh, category is our education and outreach grants about recycling. That is a total of 75 million, which is $15 million per year in grant funding. And then we got funding from the infrastructure bill for two efforts with regard to batteries. Uh, one was to develop best practices for batteries, and the other was to work on voluntary labeling guidelines for batteries. The battery work is not a grant program. It is uh, funding that was given to us to uh, work on batteries related issues. So if we could go to the next slide. <clears throat> So our solid waste infrastructure for recycling grants. These are the ones I said uh, we have $55 million a year over five years. And the goal of these grants is to support improvements in recycling programs, post-consumer materials management, waste management infrastructure. Several of you on the panel talked about those kind of issues. Um, we have listed on the slide here eligible entities for these grants, and you should all see yourselves on this slide, which I Hope is encouraging to you. Um, right now, we are holding a number of listening sessions to talk with folks, just like I'm having the opportunity to talk with you today. We will also be issuing a request for information to hear some more input on designing these programs. And we hope that by uh, later this year, we will be releasing the request for applications for these grants. So if we could go to the next slide. The next slide is about our education and outreach grant program. Again, this is $15 million per year. And as the title says, it is to support education and outreach on consumer recycling and waste prevention, um, to inform the public on what's accepted in community recycling programs, and to increase collection rates and decrease contamination. So you should also see yourselves under the eligible entities um, for these grants as well, uh, as well as um, other eligible entities. So I'm excited to share with you that you are all eligible um, to put in applications once we get to that point on this um, process as well. So again, very similar to our solid waste infrastructure grants for our education and outreach grants. We're doing listening sessions just like tonight. Um, we'll be doing a request for information. As part of this uh, program, we will be developing a model recycling program toolkit for communities. So that's something we're pretty excited about. And then again, later this year, we hope to release the request for applications for these grant programs. Um, so the sixth and final slide that I have is the one that to me is the most important one because this is where I want to hear from you. So we've listed some discussion questions and um, as we said, this will be a test of how interactive we can really be from uh, here in my house in Maryland and you in the conference um, having some interaction on some of these scoping questions that we would love some input on on our grants program. So again, thinking about the grants, uh, the first one being solid waste infrastructure for recycling and the second one being um, education and outreach around recycling. The first question I was hoping folks could uh, give input on is how can we maximize the benefits of these grants for you uh, in your territories? What what kinds of things we're just creating this program from scratch. It never existed before, which is a great opportunity to design it from the beginning. And um, I will pause there and see if anyone has any inputs or ideas on this first question. 
So please, um, any of the um, island representatives, um, feel free to interject. And this will be a little challenging because we in the room cannot see our virtual participants. Um, so let's see how this goes. Right. Hello, this is uh, Walter Derringer, Guam EPA. Um, you know, actually looking at all five um, questions there, um, some of the things that uh, the challenges that Guam and I'm sure that our neighboring brothers and sisters have is 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 our location, and based on our location, uh, it brings upon uh, challenges that uh, Conus does not have, or even areas that uh, are close to Conus. Um, so, uh, for instance, um, the shipment of recycled goods uh, to to beneficial re reuse. Um, we have we used to be able to ship to um, closer countries in Asia for like um, um, our used tires and um, and some other recyclable commodities. Uh, but with the COVID and with China doing their um, their closing closing of the borders. Uh, just for instance, our tires now need to be shipped to Sri Lanka or India, which just the cost alone is is enormously uh, it's an enormous uptake by doing that from shipping it to Japan and, and South Korea and whatnot. Another thing that just came up is is the delicate nature of our shipping lanes. Uh, we have one shipping uh, company. Um, I won't say their name that 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 removes hazardous waste slash recycled goods from Guam. They had recently they had an incident in their on one of their um, vessels that they have actually stopped and ceased uh, removal of hazardous waste and recyclable goods at this point uh, until a, a later date. So not only is it the cost of the shipping, but also the um, again the, uh, the delicateness of having one shipping uh, company removing our hazways and recyclable goods um, and and this includes even uh, lead acid batteries which can does not really fit the, the um, hazardous waste but it's a recycling stream and so that's why I kind of lumped them together uh, so that that to me is our biggest concern at this point the second one that we have is just getting the outreach to the community um, I believe uh, the recycled uh, material that we have is, is um, that is collected, 30% is contaminated, and um, you know that's just people throwing pizza boxes with pizza still in it, or or drinks with uh, or um, drinking uh, containers with fluid still in it, and uh, just again that that would fit some of those uh, numbers, uh, those questions there of outreach, um, it, and again it's just. Um, it's it's a big problem. I'm sure Conus has it, but I think ours is magnified because of our uh, our lack of uh, real estate. So, um, I mean, I've read when China closed down that a lot of cities in the United States had to uh, actually dispose of their recyclable waste stream or recyclable stream into the landfills because they either had no more space or they it, their their material got contaminated. Well. Uh, as living on a Guam, our, our landfill capacity is is limited because we don't have all the land. Our land is precious, and um, you know we we hear that from all the islands. And so I think just outreach to try to keep our recyclable stream cleaner and less contaminated. And then I I don't know what the the solution is for shipping costs uh, because that's that's the industry driven. Um, uh, uh, I guess expense, let alone if that one company decides to uh, forever close down their doors as far as shipping out uh, hazardous waste and recyclable waste, well then we're really in a bind. And uh, that's where uh, I know the government of Guam does not have the funds to, to pull this out and that's where the federal government would need to figure something out, whether that be an MOA or MOU with the uh, Department of Defense or just using some of this money, maybe not anticipated for for such a large um, endeavor such as this, because uh, we didn't anticipate this company shutting its uh, its operations down for now. And um, to be quite honest, before I left, there was still not a, a start date when they would pick up that effort again. So, uh, 
we are in a very precarious situation at this point until that company decides to start uh, moving on with their operations. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for pointing out thank those you. two very important director. issues. Thank, I think. Thank you, uh, Director LG. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I think just briefly in response, and also to Director Walter's uh, point on um, Asia, the impact of Asia's decision, particularly China, uh, to change uh, its stance on what sort of recyclables it was willing to purchase. I think the whole region. Right, uh, Asia included, uh, felt the ripple effect of that. But to your first question about how EPA can maximize the benefits of these grants, I think that's something that all of the federal partners have been asking us. So uh, that requires a real thoughtful and considerate uh, response on our part. But as I mentioned yesterday uh, in the networking session, uh, and as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, the territories, you know, need additional capacity, uh, not only on our side, but on your side. Um, we're so fortunate um, that the assistance we're receiving through ASADRA uh, and our project officer, and I'd like to call her out, Michelle Baker, she's been super helpful, supportive uh, with all the guidance as uh, we execute on uh, the various phases that we've set out uh, for our comprehensive solid waste uh, management planning efforts. Um, but yeah, so again, I think maybe one sort of immediate response I would have to question one for everybody is, I think EDA um, in their engagement with the CNMI with the Disaster Recovery Act funding that we received uh, from 2019 uh, in assigning a project officer, uh, well, supposedly to oversee the Pacific region, but he's stationed on Saipan uh, because we got the bulk of, of the money. Uh, I think that should be something that all of the federal agencies consider doing uh, with the BIL money, and that is to uh, source uh, an individual uh, from your agency and plant them on the ground at each one of our territories. <laughs> that would be my sort of off the cuff sort of response to that. Uh, but yes, uh, real close partnership and guidance uh, is something that we need. And and again, I would, I would say that in the case of the CNMI and USVI, as a result of the disasters uh, that hit our islands, we're dealing with that disaster recovery uh, initiative, right? And those are really large. Uh, so you add to that uh, COVID CARES Act funding, and then now this, um, it's, it's, very, uh, it, it's quite a tall order. For, for everybody involved, including the federal partners. So that that's sort of my response. And if well, I could just uh, add to that and address question four there in terms of defining and measuring success, one of the uh, metrics we identified in our comprehensive sustainable development plan relating to goal 12, sustainable consumption and production patterns does relate to reducing the amount of recyclable materials that are going into our environmentally compliant waste management facilities by 50% by 2030. And the question of where do we put that recyclable waste uh, needs to be addressed. And so looking at ways to reuse these materials on island, create jobs to say shred tires, put it back into roads or other uh, environmentally sound reuse practices so we don't have to pay to ship it uh, enormous distances at exorbitant costs would be helpful. So I think there is technical capacity there that EPA could continue to invest in. They've done tremendous work in the zero waste guidance that's been being provided. Um, and I think it's not just our, our territories that would benefit from guidance about how to better use recyclable materials on site so we don't have to deal with final disposal, which we know a lot of our plastics are uh, ultimately being disposed of. It's, uh, it's the waste product. So how do we get that out of our consumption stream so we don't have to manage that waste on the back end is a question that EPA can continue to build capacity to address. Um, and I, I think that, you know, having these listening sessions, asking these questions and providing some 
time to consider them and respond to them perhaps even in advance so we can get our technical experts on board and continue this conversation would be really valuable. And also having it in this for format again, appreciate OIA bringing us all together. But I think a lot of uh, the territories have similar questions. And so as we're doing the speed dating rounds, trying to get our individual questions uh, answered, perhaps there's an opportunity to continue that format in a virtual setting so that we can continue this dialogue together, get our answers uh, together and, and work towards shared solutions. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And um, we are coming close to time, but I want to make sure that we give an opportunity for the virtual participants. I believe that one person has their hand raised. And so Carolyn, um, we'll let the one um, individual with the question go next and um, we'll wrap this up. But it's obvious that there's lots of discussion and opportunity here for you know further chatting. So we will continue this in the um, office hour sessions coming up. Um, so was uh, the virtual participant with their hand up? Yes, it should be uh, Tyrone Titano. Um, feel free to mute yourself, unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. And thank you for taking time. I will make this rather quick. One of the other strategies that we have in Guam in dealing with waste other than uh, setting up for recycling and shipping it off island to major recycling markets is a sort of zero waste approach where we uh, look for uh, ways to convert waste into resources for uh, green economy enterprises, like for example, concerning biosolids from the uh, sewage treatment plant to potting soil. Uh, we use you know, other materials for uh, bedding for uh, water infrastructure or for roads. Um, we have um, uh, mostly funded that from local resources here, but as we get to the later stages there, we're seeking other grant opportunities to do so. Can uh, EPA provide assistance in, in perhaps identifying how to leverage existing federal opportunities for this purpose? We have submitted a grant uh, to EDA that uh, got declined, and we plan to resubmit um, it also under uh, a TAP grant for Interior. But to the extent there are other resources out there at EPA, is, is there a way to help work uh, with the government of Guam to sort of identify what resources to leverage for that solution? And how would we go about that? Okay. And uh, if um, are we able to see the participants' faces virtual? If you could pull the slide down. Just want to see if Carolyn is still on the line. Yep, she's, and also give you the opportunity, the Carolyn, to just um, address that or close up um, so we can allow our uh, friends from Department of Energy to give their presentation. Yeah, thank you. Can you still hear me? Yes. I am still here. Um, thank you for the great comments that I was able to hear. And as I said in the chat, um, if other people have thoughts and ideas they wanna share with us, I hope we can find a way to get those. Um, I know some of my colleagues will be at the networking cafe. I will not be there, but I look forward to them reporting back to me any uh, great input that you share at that. And. Um, we also uh, will continue to be interested in hearing your feedback if you end up going back to your offices and getting thoughts from other people that you want to work that you work with that you want to share with us we would love to hear that as well so i hope we can stay connected um, with any feedback that you have for us now or in the future it would be really great thank you so much Thank you so much, Carolyn. And um, we have an, an EPA colleague here in the room who will also be at the Networking Cafe, Angela Sandoval. So please, if your questions weren't answered um, in this session, um, please bring them to the next one. Thank you so much. I'd like to now introduce our final panelists for this um, session, and that is uh, individuals from the Department of Energy, Greg Dierkers. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, and uh, I'll be quick uh, so you can get to the Networking Cafe. Uh, want to just mention two areas where DOE is working uh, on waste to energy, uh, one of which is battery recycling, which uh, uh, my colleague from EPA uh, mentioned there's a program that EPA is running, but uh, DOE has actually developed a blueprint uh, that the bill build provisions uh, collectively uh, at about $7 billion uh, in funding for battery recycling reuse and uh, I think some redesign work uh, and that's that's just funding to the Department uh, of Energy uh, but previously prior to bill we've been working on the uh, ability to, to take batteries uh, from electric transportation 
uh, and turn them into and, and figure out what to do with those batteries. So uh, we've done some R&D work in that area, and that's where some of the seven billion goes. But we've also laid out a blueprint, probably most interesting to people here is a blueprint to establish uh, really a secure battery supply chain, look, recognizing that about 80% of the, the battery components come from uh, are manufactured in China, and, and China actually is controlling a lot of the resources that go into batteries, uh, such as lithium uh, and, and cobalt. And so what we're, what we're trying to do is figure out how can DOE support uh, the territories and, and, uh, and others in developing a battery fact that has at least some manufacturing and, and uh, resources from the U.S. And so that's, there's a lot to unpack in that. Uh, and I think there's some opportunities for the territories to be involved. Um, you know, in addition, we've got some projects, and so I'll just mention one other one, and then I'll then I'll wrap up. No slides. Um, I think you've seen enough slides, so I'll feel free to get in touch with me with more information. But the other the other area of waste to energy where we spent a fair amount of time is looking at uh, biosolids in, in the wastewater treatment field, and uh, I think we all know about 30 billion kilowatts of hour energy use per year are spent to treat wastewater uh, uh, across the U.S. and the territories. And so we've been working in this area for quite a while, um, definitely for the last couple of years intensively. And so what that what that means is technical assistance. Uh, we don't have direct funding, at least not currently, uh, but we do have a technical assistance program that has outlined a toolkit for how municipalities and their facilities can save energy. And that includes some low to no cost options that can save you, uh, you know, five to seven percent a year at, at, again, no cost or very minimal costs. Um, the toolkit also includes some best practices on data management and other programs. So I wanted to highlight that this is the project itself is the Sustainable Wastewater Infrastructure Treatment Program. It's called SWIFT for short. So I'll I'll share information on that as well, and I will make sure that you all get access to both the battery work we're doing on recycling reuse uh, and the blueprint on that, and then on the SWIFT accelerator program, which is include, again, includes a toolkit that I think you all be able to uh, access. Uh, and I'll just mention too, if you get a chance to write it down, um, our bioenergy technology program, uh, BETO for short, in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, uh, has has long been working on wastewater waste energy issues, and so they've they've covered the gamut um, through their recent. And a lot of it is is sort of mid to later stage R and D, but they've worked in commercial, institutional, residential food wastes, uh, keeping keeping re those those uh, wastes out of landfills, as well as biosolids and uh, other organic waste from agriculture and um, and biorefinery uh, work as well around. Uh, the development of uh, biofuels from crops as well as wastewater, uh, waste uh, oil. So thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap up there. Just uh, wanted to just flag a few, a couple of those programs. Again, the the work we're doing on batteries and and then some technical assistance on helping facilities uh, save energy in the treatment of waste. Uh, so uh, back to back to the uh, moderator. Thank you so much for the information and for the gift of no slides. That brings us to the end of our panel discussions. We made it. Um, I'd like to give a big round of applause to all of our panelists again. And I'm going to turn it over now to Mr. Basil for some instructions on the networking session. Getting there. Yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alain, for for, for handling the, this um, important topic. Thank you, the panelists from, from the territories as well as our federal partners. Um, we're going to now be transitioning. Um, Betsy, you have an announcement? Okay, okay. <laughs> and so... So uh, I'm going to bring Betsy up for a special announcement, but I'm going to give you some, some details. We're going to be transitioning to the cafe breakouts at, that will begin promptly at 5 o'clock. Um, how we're doing it is, again, virtually. Um, Vanita um, put, put in, pushed in the Hulu messaging um, some details of 
where you're going to be entering for, for the territories. Again, we're following the same format where the, each territory is going to have their individual 20 minutes with each of the panels that we had today. So Betsy is going to be um, hosting the natural infrastructure. Um, I will continue with energy and Elena will continue with legacy pollution. Um, so our federal partners who were serving on those panels, um, please enter through HOVA those chat sessions and Vanessa is going to discuss where the territories will enter those individual cafe sites for their 20 minutes. Did, did I get that right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you um, for your patience in the shift for today's uh, schedule. So I think you can see um, online our new schedule for today. So American Samoa, there will be a 20 minute break. So you're free to join any other room if you'd like to listen in. Uh, but you will start at 520 in the natural infrastructure room, and then you'll move to energy and then you'll move to legacy pollution. And uh, the Virgin Islands, you will start in the natural infrastructure room, and then you'll move to energy, and then you'll move to legacy pollution. For Guam, you will start in natural infrastructure. No, I'm getting that wrong. Guam will start in the legacy pollution room, and then you'll have a break for 20 minutes, and then you'll go to natural infrastructure, and then you'll go to energy. CNMI, you will start in the energy room you'll have a break for 20 minutes you'll then you'll go to natural infrastructure and then you'll go to energy um so i i hope that that um is somewhat clear and then for all you federal agencies um if you are in the natural infrastructure panel you'll go to that session in whova all the energy agencies will go to that session uh, with Basel, and then legacy pollution will go to that session with Elena. Uh, so please raise your hand um, in the room if you have any questions, um, and we'll give you all about five to 10 minutes to find your session link, and we will see you in Hoover. But before we go, I just have got to acknowledge um, the incredible team that we had to put this together. I feel like this is my last opportunity to do this, but Benita, come here. Julie, come here. Christina, come here. Um, these three women, uh, you've all talked to them. You've all met them. They are the most amazing women. I feel so lucky that I, um, I get to work with them. They just... As you saw, they just adjust and adapt and, and, and problem solve on the fly, and they just they just have to come up. I wish you were all here and clapping for them. So, but come on, come on, come on. Thank you. You know, I just want to say, Betsy, in the CNMI, it's Women's Month. Yay. So, how appropriate. Yeah, here, here. <laughs> all right. Well, this is what um, the future looks like. So thank you all so much for um, celebrating them with me. Awesome job from Guam. Thank you. See you in the cafes. Thank you. <laughs>